Day one of the Novena to St. Philip, May 17th, Philip's Humility. If Philip heard of anyone having committed a crime, he would say, Thank God that I have not done worse. At confession, he would shed abundance of tears and say, I have never done a good action. When a penitent showed that she could not bear the rudeness shown towards him by certain persons who were under great obligations to him, he answered her, If I were humble, God would not send this to me. When one of his spiritual children said to him, Father, I wish to have something of yours for devotion, for I know you are a saint. He turned to her with a face full of anger and broke out into these words, Be gone with you. I am a devil and not a saint. To another who said to him, Father, a temptation has come to me to think that you are not what the world takes you for. He made answer, Be sure of this, that I am a man like my neighbors and nothing more. If he heard of any who had a good opinion of him, he used to say, O oh, oh, poor me, how many poor girls will be greater in paradise than I shall be. He avoided all marks of honor. He could not bear to receive any signs of respect. When people wished to touch his clothes and knelt as he passed by, he used to say, Get up, get out of my way. He did not like people to kiss his hand, though he sometimes let them do so, lest he should hurt their feelings. He was an enemy to all rivalry and contention. He always took in good part everything that was said of him. He had a particular dislike of affectation, whether in speaking or in dressing or in anything else. He could not bear two-faced persons, and as for liars, he could not endure them, and is continually reminding his spiritual children to avoid them as they would a pestilence. He always asked advice, even on affairs of minor importance. His constant counsel to his penitents was that they should not trust in themselves, but always take the advice of others, and get as many prayers as they could. He took great pleasure in being lightly esteemed, nay, even despised. He had a most pleasant manner of transacting business with others, great sweetness in conversation, and is full of compassion and consideration. He had always a dislike to speak of himself, the phrases, I said, or I did, were rarely in his mouth. He exhorted others never to make a display of themselves, especially in those things which tended to their credit, whether in earnest or in joke. As St. John the Evangelist, when old, was continually saying, little children love one another. So Philip was ever repeating his favorite lesson, be humble, think little of yourselves. He said that if we did a good work, and another took the credit of it to himself, we ought to rejoice and thank God. He said no one ought to say, oh, I shall not fall, I shall not commit sin, for it was a clear sign that he would fall. He was greatly displeased with, with those who made excuses for themselves, and called such persons My Lady Eve, because Eve defended herself instead of being humble. Humility is often called the bedrock virtue of the spiritual life. Pride closes our eyes and minds to God, to each other, and to our weaknesses and our falls. Without humility, we can do nothing. Because ultimately, without God, we can do nothing. But just as there are many false gods, so too there is false humility. And perhaps that's why true humility is so difficult and so often denigrated. False humility is an ugly virtue. It's not a virtue at all. And that's why so often we cringe at the thought that we should be practicing that non-virtue. I think we've all met the classmate or the teammate who has just nailed it. The presentation, the goal, the save, the performance of a lifetime, who, when he is complimented, cheered, and congratulated, replies, oh, it was nothing. Anyone could have done it. And we have a sense that he's really hoping that the compliments, the encouragement, the congratulations will keep on. By faking humility, we, yes, we have to include ourselves, are seeking praise and esteem. 
we're really opening the door to more praise, humbly encouraging the bystanders to pile it along. More and more, I like it. Don't stop, keep it up. I need to hear more. And then there's the man who makes a mistake. Not a moral fault, not a sin. Something minuscule, a social gaffe, nothing serious. Perhaps he drops a, a whole tray of glasses or trips over the rug and who immediately shakes his head in self-disgust and shame. Not because of sorrow, but because of pride. He realizes that for a brief moment, his mask has slipped and he's outed himself. He's revealed himself as the idiot, the incompetent, the ordinary human being that he is. If only I hadn't made that gaffe, people wouldn't see the real me that I'm ashamed of. I have to do a better job of keeping that mask on. No wonder we think, if that is humility, no thanks. Listen to St. Philip. Lord, if you do not keep your hand on this Philip, he will make the wound in your heart even bigger. Lord, I have never done any good. Lord, watch out for this Philip, for I will betray you first chance I get. And yet, coming from St. Philip, it doesn't sound to me hollow or false. He meant it. It was true and he knew it. So what is the difference? The difference is the distance between God and man, between God and sin, and the knowledge of that vast gulf. St. Philip knew himself. He knew himself as he was left to himself. He knew what he could be, he would be without grace. There but for the grace of God go I. The earliest attribution of this proverb to St. Philip only goes back to 1903. Did not Philip Neri say to himself, as he saw a criminal hauled to execution, there thou goest, Philip, but for the grace of God? And if thou hast escaped all these things, and the many, many more, too numerous to mention, go down on thy knees and thank thy God for his mercies. One of St. Philip's maxims that helps explain his humility and his holiness is this one. Never say what great things the saints do. Say rather what great things God does through his saints. Isn't that basically the message of the gospel? But Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And again, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Isn't that the message of St. Paul too? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. About the, the embarrassed, head-shaking, conceited man, this is what St. Philip teaches. Excessive sadness seldom springs from any other source than pride. And again, when a man has fallen, he ought to attribute it to pride, saying, ah, if I had been humble, I should not have fallen, rather than making an excuse for himself. True humility is amazing and beautiful, inspiring. It is, sadly, 
rare. That's why St. Philip's humility is so important to us. It's genuine. It's recognizably genuine. It's attainable, too, because there, with the grace of God, I can go. So let me end with one last important maxim of, of our Holy Father on how to attain humility. One of the best means of obtaining humility is sincere and frequent confession. St. Philip, pray for us. Philip, my glorious patron, who does countless draws the praise and even the good esteem of men, obtain for me also from my Lord and Savior this fair virtue by thy prayers. How haughty are my thoughts, how contemptuous are my words, how ambitious are my works. Gain for me that low esteem of self to which thou wast gifted. Obtain for me a knowledge of my own nothingness, that I may rejoice when I am despised and ever seek to be great only in the eyes of my God and judge.